we have the artistic imperative and we have the social imperative. And where do we find the intersection of those, of those two issues and needs? And that was fascinating to try and find our way through that. And there aren't easy answers. Welcome to Arts Engines. I am your host, Aaron Dworkin. And today we have with us as our guest, Deborah Borda, who serves as president and CEO of the New York Philharmonic. Deborah, welcome to Arts Engines. Aaron, terrific to see you, although it's from afar. Uh, but I guess we're all learning a brand new way of thinking and living and considering what the future is going to be like. Exactly. You speak the truth. And uh, on that front, um, you know, uh, how are things at the Phil? Obviously, you know, you are, you know, uh, based there in one of the main epicenters of the, the pandemic and that has just been so, you know, tragically hit. Um, so I'm just wondering, how are you? How is the Phil? Uh, how are things? Well, well, let me start with a positive note about the Phil which is, you know, we're 178 years old. We got through one civil war, two world wars, and the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. So at the end of this, we will be around. We may be a little different. We may, we don't know what that will be yet. We're going to invent that together with the musicians and the board and our audiences. But um, we will be there. And that's, there is going to be a need, no matter what, for music and for the New York Philharmonic. In terms of our New York Philharmonic family, uh, some people have been stricken with the virus. Happily, thank goodness, they have recovered, both the musicians and staff. Uh, and you know, we've been able to talk to them and help to see them through that. Uh, I am coming to you, not from David Geffen Hall, where I would normally be talking to you from, but a few blocks to the north of that from my apartment on the Upper West Side, which for me has become Philharmonic Central. Uh, one of the remarkable changes that will stick with all of us, I think, Aaron, is what it is like to work away from a traditional office setting. So about the 10 days before we got into actual lockdown, I think some of us started to see this coming. So for people who didn't have home setups, we got people really good laptops, and we actually excused departments so they would go home and work at home for a day so people could figure out how to do this. And I will say that when the shutdown order came you know, in the middle of March and we sent everybody home, it was remarkable just how quickly everybody kicked into gear. And we have gotten so much done since that time. So it makes you start to think about, you know, there were things that we held, we, held absolutely dear. We thought, well, we have to go into the office, you know, so many days a week. It's all going to change. We're going to learn other things. And I think it's going to help people to think about um, when women have children, how they can work with that in a very effective way. It just, it's just the many ramifications are, are fantastic. Yeah, no, it's truly profound uh, and historic uh, times, although I like that context that you put it in, which sometimes helps. Um, is there a, a sense that you've had already so far of, you know, with these changes, um, uh, you know, kind of what have you learned so far? In other words, are there things that you're like, you know, this is interesting that this may be something we might incorporate beyond just the immediate need to because we can't all be in the office together. Are there ways of either operating or of thinking about the organization that you found have not just been you know, a negative, but actually a potential opportunity moving forward? Well, I think actually what I would come back to is that foundational need for strategic planning, and for operational execution of those plans. That is extremely important. And I think our ability to do that is helping to guide us, to guide us through this, this challenge. I think some people were surprised perhaps when the Philharmonic rather early on announced that, look, we don't see coming back this season, the rest of our subscription season. We'll see what's gonna happen in the summer. And I know managers called me and different people called me and questioned me about it. And I said, look, I am doing as much research as I can now, all of us are, but what I think is we have to focus on what the reality is and then 
come up with a plan that is nimble and react, not just reactive, but proactive, in getting us out in front of what was going to happen. Now, it turns out there's no way in hell, excuse me, we could have come back before June, and we don't know exactly when we'll be able to come back. So I think that there are foundations of good management that still exist. Another thing that is just of paramount importance is communication. Are we communicating effectively and honestly and openly as possible with all of the members that make up our institution? That has to do with musicians, with staff, with board, with audience. And so I, I think there are certain pillars that we know about of good management and, and those still work and we have to stand by those. In terms of the rest, is it a moment where we can look into the future and work with the musicians? And by the way, our musicians have been fantastic. Um, when we negotiated for the shutdown through June, I wouldn't, I would barely call it a negotiation or I might call it a, a negotiation of mutuality. It's working together to figure out how can we come through this together and how can we serve our audience? Um, and if people can bring and organizations can bring that kind of spirit, sometimes you come out of a crisis and in fact, it can make an organization stronger. And I think that's an interesting kind of measure. Do you come out of a crisis stronger or are you destroyed by the crisis? Yeah, absolutely. No, and it seems like, I mean, there are unfortunately some organizations I've seen that there that don't seem to be doing that planning um, and think bringing that strategy into play and are just reacting and unfortunately with an unfolding pandemic and process like this i think it's uh unfortunately can do a disservice so uh, i really appreciate those thoughts um to kind of back things back out a little bit from the pandemic and just to you and your leadership right obviously you've been an extraordinary leader and what you've already done in new york and obviously the transformation in in los angeles um, I'm just kind of curious as you've looked at these um, major arts institutions that, that you have led, um, has there been one kind of overarching um, either theme or principle that you bring to your leadership regardless of the organization um, that you feel is kind of something that potentially other arts leaders, those who might want to follow in your footsteps, those who are leading smaller institutions, uh, might be helped guided by? Are there kind of overarching principles that you have? Well, I think the ability of a leader to help the organization they work for, and indeed the community, coalesce around a truly meaningful vision is, is our task. And we may not form it alone. We may borrow it from other places. It may come from our artistic leaders. It may come from our community leaders. But the ability to coalesce an organization to believe fervently, we matter and here is why we will make a difference. Now, I think that's, I think that's tremendously important. I think another aspect, if I look back, that would now seems like a very long career, um, was, an essential sense of optimism and belief in the art form that said, even in our most difficult times, let's invest because we, we cannot cut our way to health. We need to invest to design the future, to invent the future, to bring people in. And there were moments when I first went to Los Angeles, which is now almost 20 years ago, when it's very questionable about whether Walt Disney Concert Hall was going to be built. And I remember a very wealthy patron saying to me, I'll give you a couple of million dollars for the endowment, but I won't give you anything. Well, he actually said, I'll give you a couple of million dollars for the endowment, and would you rather have that or for the hall? You want it for the endowment, don't you? And I said, no, I, don't, I want it for the hall because the hall is the future. And so it's that kind of investment. It's that kind of also ability to take risks. Because if we don't take risks and make mistakes, we will never learn. We will never move ahead. So I think those would be uh, sort of critical factors for people to consider. Now, it seems very easy for me to say this, you know, sitting as head of the New York Philharmonic or of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Um, but I think I've actually applied that kind of thought throughout my career. Yeah. So to kind of go uh, uh, to inquire a little more about that, when you talk about risk, 
So obviously, you know, at the LA Phil, you know, one of the amazing things was really leading the efforts to, uh, to engage uh, Gustavo Dudamel with the orchestra. Um, did you see or view that as, as kind of a risk because it was for the field in certain ways so historic? Or did you view that as kind of a risk or do a risk assessment associated with that? Or what were kind of some of the things that you would want us to know about your process with that? Yes, so many people ask me, you know, afterwards, you know, you must have just woken up in the middle of the night. And, you know, I believed so profoundly in Gustavo and what he could do as a musician and as a human being that um, I was just convinced to my core that this was the right place to go. And as other you know, important thinkers and leaders within the institution began to look at him, although they might not have been there at the beginning, they came to see that this was a, yes, it was a risky choice, and yet it, this is, it was a risky choice that didn't feel like a risk to me. I was so convinced, and, and all of us were, not all of us, but enough of us were to carry the day. Uh, so I think back on, on that as, um, really a pivotal point for not only the institution, but for the way people started to think about these big institutions. And when I think of Gustavo, you know, for me, one of the, one of the great lessons I take away or took away was that it is so remarkably important to be able to work with people who are younger than you and people of different ages. I learned so much. From Gustavo Dudamel. I know sometimes say, oh, you, you were his mentor. Or this. We worked together as a team, but what I took away was every bit what he got, maybe more. And one of the critical lessons for the Philharmonic, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and for me, was being able to really think about a couple of things. But one was, you, we have the artistic imperative and we have the social imperative. And where do we find the intersection? Of those of those two issues and needs, and that was fascinating to try and find our way through that. And there aren't easy answers. Yeah, absolutely. And so, kind of on another factor, of course, as you know, I've spent a fair amount of my time working in diversity and thinking about equity and inclusion in these issues that relate to the arts. You have been an extraordinary leader and the first female leader, obviously, of a major orchestra. And um, wondering uh, if you've had thoughts about that. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, do you view yourself as, uh, as a leader also related to gender or do you just view yourself as a leader? What would you say to kind of, you know, especially young women aspiring to, to follow in your footsteps uh, about how they view diversity, uh, gender equality in our field, especially in leadership positions? Well, you know, Aaron, I used to pretend early in my career that it didn't matter. <laughs> uh, so what, I'm a woman, so what, I'm, I'm successful. Um, I also had my share of actually, frankly, harassment, which I just didn't talk about. None of us did. It wasn't the thing to do if you wanted to get ahead. And as I think about that now, I really feel like it is very important that women, and in fact, everybody, but particularly for women, that they're allowed to be their authentic selves. And when I'm mentoring people, that is, or I'm talking to groups, that is one of the things that I try, I try to really impress on them. But my own journey has been, you know, I, I look at the changes in myself from pretending it didn't matter that I was the first woman to run, you know, one of the old big five orchestras or any of the accomplishments. And now I look back and I think, wow, you know, I would be interviewed by an all-male board of directors. There would be an all-male orchestra committee in those days, and this is all completely changed. You know, you would come into it, you know, mostly all your, all your vice presidents would be male. It was just very, very different. And I, 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 I think happily, happily of how different the world is. And um, one of the, I tried to live this in my life. I always try to make a difference. I really tried to put it into action in, in Los Angeles. And what I hope is in this whole pandemic crisis that we're in right now, 
uh, and uh, people may be watching this at times when nobody remembers what the pandemic was, but that what doesn't happen is that these issues slip to the bottom of our list because we are so desperate just to keep ourselves in business. And it's only through mindfulness uh, that you can, you can try to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we're, we're almost out of time, but I always like to ask in my interviews, uh, if my guest has kind of, if there were three things, three kind of, you know, key either uh, principles or, you know, action steps that you would want to leave people in the field with who are trying to achieve their goals. This could be direct orchestral musicians, or it could be those who are looking to be in leadership roles in the orchestral field. Are there kind of, you know, three, you know, takeaways or things that you would suggest people consider, think about, try to employ in their life so that they can really achieve those goals? Number one, I would say, be honest. Honesty is, there's a paucity of honesty in the world today. And that honesty relates to what I said before, and authenticity. So I think you put those two things together. And to me, for a humane and successful leader, that is really critical. Uh, I think we must always, as leaders, consider our communication, our skills, that you can almost never over communicate. Uh, and I don't mean getting on the phone for half an hour and bending somebody's ear, but thinking about the larger ways within an institution, we structure the messages and we portray the brand. I, mean, I know that's a marketing word, but what is the brand that we want to bring to the outside world? And then the third thing is, I hope you are doing, I hope you are doing what you love to do because we only have one life. We're gonna have plenty of time to sleep later on or, you, really find what works for you because if you have that inspiration you, you may make some wrong turns along the way but you'll get to the right destination and the wrong turns can be very amusing sometimes <laughs> awesome well deborah borda you are truly one of the great arts engines in our field thank you so much for joining us here today Aaron, thank you for having me. Take care. Be safe. Mm -hmm.